pretty complicated gun. They look simple, but they're in their own way. They're fairly complicated. They have uh, certain architectural features that are unique to them. Um, and there's a lot of uh, misinformation or things about the guns that, that people uh, don't necessarily correct. Um, my little, my little system up here. This is straight up until about the last three quarters of an inch and it dubs down into the cone. And the, the bottom of the stock is, is straight or it can be slightly concave. There never, there's never a belly in a hog and rifle. Um, as far as the, the parts, I have a set of parts that I use. Um, I normally, well, like bob roller triggers and locks, but they're not available anymore. Bob's quick make them. So I use uh, Davis uh, lock and triggers. Uh, most of the parts I get from Track and Wolf, just like everybody else, I make my own nose caps. Um, and I just, uh, I have a, a really nice original gun that I copy that I try and emulate. Uh, as far as uh, finishing up the gun, um, I do two things, either a uh, like a new finish or a semi-antique finish. This one's a, a semi-antique finish gun. It's done with, uh, I polish the metal or like bright, just like, just like you would for anything. And then I apply cold glue, dab it on kind of heavily, and then soak the gun in, uh, in Clorox bleach for just a few minutes. And that varies, I don't know, why, but one time I do it, it'll take 10 minutes. Another time it'll take two minutes. It's just how, how it works that day. Um, as far as the, uh, I, I, I do that, and I let it, let it dry, bring it out of the bleach, let it dry, and then cart it off with a wheel, and normally I just have to do it one time. I do that to all the metal parts basically the same way. Uh, the stock, when I, when I finish the bat, when I get it ready to finish, I treat it with nitric acid and a heat gun. And that'll make it give it a look like a, a chocolatey brown color. And then I, I put stain over that and use a, I use a spar, a satin spar varnish, exterior spar varnish. And it has to be, you can't use gloss to get it way too shiny. The satin comes out shiny enough. And I thin that out with some alcohol, mineral spirits, or it doesn't really matter what you thin it with. Make it about the consistency of water. And then I put a little Japan dryer in it to help it speed up the process of the drying. And I apply that with 400 uh, grit wet dry auto body paper, just little squares of it. I dip in the, dip in the finish and do a small section of the stock at a time. And that'll, it does two things, it, three things. It, it, uh, it applies the, the, the finish to the wood, it allows the finish to soak into the wood, and it also fills the pores of the wood with the, through the sanding, the, the, the debris from sanding. And I'll do a small section of the stock at a time, take an old sock or some kind of a cloth, a soft cloth, perhaps cotton rag, and rub everything off that'll come off. And I go over, go over the whole entire stock like, like that, set it aside and dry for a day, and come back and do it again the next day. And again, it varies depending on the wood. And, uh, I don't know what all else it depends on, but uh, sometimes, sometimes you can get them done in about three applications. Sometimes it takes six or seven. It just depends on how it works on that particular project. Probably, I get my hands on all these things that I can, study them, measure them, photograph them, whatever I can do. And I found that, in my opinion, probably 80% of the guns 
original guns were made with probably 20% of all that. I found one squirrel rifle that was made out of uh, birch wood, but other than that, they're made from walnuts. set of problems architecturally as far as building a gun. To do one, the, the, the standard plane rifle, and what I call my standard plane rifle, is an inch and an eighth wide at the breech, the barrel tapers to one inch and 36 inches. So the barrel's tapering forward. If you look, I'll have a primitive rifle around you, I'll look at it closer. The lock panels taper also. But they taper the opposite direction, wider in the front, narrower in the back. So you've got two planes put together, different angles, and then you have to make that, those fit together and have the breach work where you can take it apart and put it back together and have it paper pop out of the gun. The uh, some of the guns have boxes on them. Most of, the, most of the boxes are simple cam over. There's some of the early guns have a cuts on the bottom, like a pit bottom. Most, most of the guns are cam over. Just, what that is, is it's got a spring under the door, and you, you, the spring tension hold is shut. Flip it over the cam, over the cam, and lets the box open. And that's uh, really, it's really a simple, effective way to do the box. Often, as a rule, we have very no carving, first of all, very little engraving. So really, the only outstanding that makes the gun the gun is the architecture. There's no
I think they, you can see a progression in the guns age-wise. Uh, the earlier guns tended to be much slimmer. The later guns had a little more wood left on them. They're, they're, they're just, uh, I don't know whether it was a style or the guys making them. I have no idea, but as a rule, you can look at a, a fairly slim gun, which this one is, and that would probably tend to be a little earlier gun. Jacob and Samuel were in, were in partnership until Jacob died in the cholera epidemic in 1849. So it's pretty, pretty well accepted that a gun that's marked J&S Hawken was prior to 49. S mark guns were, were later. And you see uh, what the shop was owned by several people. John Gimmer was the last owner of the shop. And you'll see guns that are exactly the same, and they'll say Gimmer on top or on and just whatever. Why that's that way, I have no idea. Maybe it's whatever stamp you put on the door, I, I have no idea. But uh, you see uh, a Gimmer Mark gun there, often in every respect, and they're generally their later gun. I think they were in the 60s, but they in the, around the time of the Civil War is when Gimmer uh, came to work for the Hawkins shop and then he eventually he eventually took it over. He ran the shop, I think in the later years. It got to be a little more of a sporting goods store kind of thing. He sold fishing equipment. Uh, modern revolver for that day, modern revolvers, and all kinds of things. He wasn't necessarily in the gun building business that heavily in later years. He had the, uh, he closed the shop eventually in 1919. He also, he made several variations of cartridge guns. He did a, a couple of uh, Gun based on Trap North Springfield, so you did uh, several Spencer, uh, Spencer Hawking conversions, and some of those, some of those will say S Hawking on the top, some of them pay, say JP Gimmer, and other than the stamp, they're identical. So why, why that was, I don't know. I like it a 1500 or something, or way back there. These are all rival. Yeah, they're rival. Uh, some reports of Gimmer shotguns, I've never seen a rival. Not to say that there are any, I just haven't seen them. Shape on it, which is 
good and the girl was amputated and it was, was replaced. They, they stressed the barrel. They had a dovetail for the front sight and the man had stressed the barrel, just put the barrel on behind the dovetail. So we didn't have to fix that. Well, I had this piece of barrel and I drove a slug through it. So the bore's in good shape. And that slug, fit, I have an original gun. That slug fits the inside of the bore of my gun perfectly. It had to have been, I think they were driving on the same machine, the same equipment. I think that's how they did it, was they did the final touch on the, on the gun or the shot. They ordered barrels from several different places. My gun has a Reynolds. The gun was made, our barrel was made by a barrel named Reynolds. And I don't know where he was or much about him, but there are, there are guns with Remington barrels or guns with nothing marked on them. There, there's, there's all kinds. They were buying their parts, I think, wherever they could get them at, at a reasonable cost. They were, they were in business to make money. things, whatever happened, they, they, very little, very little, I don't know if there's anything, uh, the day-to-day -day operations at a shop, how they operate and how many people they have worked for them, I don't think anyone knows. Uh, there's a conjecture, you can guess, but I don't think there's ever been anything that's set in stone that this is what they did and how they did it. Uh, the squirrel rivals, they're they're a different ball game. They have they have all the features, all the architectural features of the plane rifle, but they're small. Generally, they don't have a hook reach. They'll have a, a semi pad reach. In other words, it doesn't come apart. The barrel it doesn't come out of except from the standing reach. And they'll very often on a squirrel rifles they will use use parts and recycle barrels and locks and probably triggers. Uh, I have two original squirrel rifles. They both had uh, locks that were on other guns. One of them was a flat lock originally and all they did was they, they plugged the holes for the for the frizzing or frizzing spring and they reduced it in size, made it smaller and put it on that rifle. Another one has uh, the lock plate was probably for a drum and nipple gun originally. It has a dovetail piece that's raised into the into the lock plate to fill that hole, that cavity. The barrels, the barrels on both of these guns were used. On the bottom of the barrel, you can see where they filled the dovetails. So they were, I think they were probably taking guns in trade or buying used old guns and then recycling the parts. They, they were doing whatever they could to make money as easily as they could, just like anybody else does. Uh, most of the squirrel rifles are, I say they're small, they'll usually have about a, usually taper barrels, sometimes swap barrels, about an inch or a little smaller at the breech. There'll be a smaller gun and usually about 40 caliber. Uh, sights, I don't know. You see, you see common type sights on them, or I say common, common to a long gun. A lot of sights are similar and some are large. So it's hard to tell whether, whether the sights were changed on a gun at one time or how they came out originally. Nobody, no way to tell. The squirrel rifle, I say, are generally a lot smaller and wider. Pistols are, there are a few, few Hawking pistols around. Uh, and then again, they, I don't know whether they, they use a lot of used parts on those or, or what they, whether they came up with stuff specific or the guns, I don't know. Fifty-four is 
just to keep them, just to keep something stand. I don't have to custom work or I get in my set set of parts, and that's what I do with my coach. Okay, I get any other questions? Yeah, they're, um, they're, they're a, uh, I don't know how to describe it, they're a, a, a screw that's threaded in through the rib into the barrel, and then they paint them over on top so it's like a rib. And then they, uh, the other ribs were hollow on those guns. They were, I think they were formed around a mandrel, which left them hollow on the inside, which saved weight, did a couple, couple of advantages, really. And then when they got done mounting the under rib, they would fill the ends on both ends of the under rib with solder or lead, something, so that it wasn't didn't have a hole in the end of the thing. And generally, about six screws hold them on. Uh, say the barrels, they vary in length from my original guns from probably. 30 inches at 38 or so inches in length. You, you see them different lengths, and they will be in proportion. They normally, normally, and not always, a four stock on a shorter barrel is going to be shorter than a four stock length on a long barrel. And the, you know, the, the rod spacing will, or the pipe spacing will be in line with that, so it's so symmetric with that. I think my guns come out about ten and a half pounds. Ten and a quarter, ten and a half, depending on the wood. Are there any original uh, sand pockets that came from his time in Ohio in the last few years? Yes, I've seen them. Uh, the question was, are there any existing best Hawken rifles from the time? I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself here. The, the Hawken brothers were, were born and raised in Hagerstown, Maryland. Their father was a man named Christian Hawken, who was just a, a wonderful Kentucky rifle owner at home, right? He had a bunch of sons, and I think all of them, at one time or another, became gun builders. A lot of them worked at Harper's Ferry Arsenal. Jacob came to St. Louis. I hear a different story. I think around 1807 or 188, and he was here by himself for a while and went a partnership with a man named James Lake for a while. Sam, Sam didn't come straight to St. Louis from Maryland. He stopped in Zeno, Ohio, for I don't, I forget how many years, a few years, and he made. Uh, I call them Ohio Flintlock Rifles. They don't look like St. Louis guns. They look like, like a cross between uh, Ohio and Maryland guns. That's what they were trained at. And he built, uh, I've seen like three of them. And they'll, they'll be on, they'll be script signed and engraved and script on the top of that that's all. And those are from the Ohio guns. And Sam came, came here to St. Louis 22, roughly, and then they formed a partnership sometime after that. And then uh, they, they continued a partnership until Jacob died in the Colorado epidemic in 1849. I got any other questions? What? I'm sorry. The question is, what's the finish on the, on the original guns and barrels? Um, I think, and this is, just, this is just my observation, I think most of the guns were probably rust-screwed 
I'm sure there were some that were left white and they turned brown and some of them were brown to start with. But I think, I think probably the majority of them were rust blue. The breach, uh, the breach of lock plate hammer, trigger guard, trigger bar, and butt plate, entry pipe, and those guys were generally, generally case hard. See a lot of guns that you can still see the colors on. Um, the, the wood, I believe they use a varnish, some type of a, some type of a varnish. And you, you see a lot of, you see some of the guns but it still has remnants of the original, original finish on them. Um, beyond that, I really, about all I know. <laughs> Just, uh, there's a lot of this stuff that's, you, you look at them, you try and figure out, and there are so many, so many ways it could have happened that you kind of just have to take your best guess at it. Go with that. This is just a pressing question I've always had. If you see a build up your right, you see a cutting your right, look how long the barrel And then I read here and there that a pocket rifle has shorter barrels on it, maybe easier to manage. shoot just as good as long barrel guns do. You know, you said like a, a four inch pistol will shoot just as good as a six inch pistol. <laughs> they, there's theories about this stuff too. We have, they, I think they loaded the guns differently than we do to start with because if you look at the old guns, they all have short front sights on. And if we put a short sight like that on our guns and blow them like we do, they're going to shoot way high. But I think, I don't think, first of all, I think that they use less power per charge than what we tend to today. And probably they didn't patch, patch the ball quite as tightly as we do. Um, the Kentuckys, the long, back to the long barrel question, it was a... Uh, it was an accepted, like almost like a fashionable thing, the style of these guns. And as the guns progressed, as they progressed from the eastern trade to the western trade, they were traveling farther distance and always on horseback. And a long barrel Kentucky don't handle good on horseback. They're just too too clumsy, too low, too unwieldy. They tended to be bigger caliber because they were bigger animals. So by by the time the Hawker rifles came around, the buffalo were gone from the east. So hence the smaller caliber Kentuckys. The guns as they went west, they were shooting farther, farther distance, bigger game. So they needed a bigger ball and powder charge. A lot of the early Kentuckys and some of the early Hawkins will be smaller caliber. And I think that's because they used less power and lead. So as it became more prevalent, they increased the power charges and the, and the size of the ball. Bring me to another quick question. When did they switch from a ball to a bullet and any muscle, whatever? You were telling me once, but when did that happen? I know it requires a different rifle, right? Yeah, the, the, the longer the projectile, the faster to spend to stabilize. A round ball twist will generally, and this is just generally, will be no faster than 48 inches, on up to 96 inches or something, even slower. A gun that's rifle for bullets will generally be around 30 inches, the, the rate of twist, so it spins faster. When that came about, um, I don't know. I do know that during the Civil War, there were sniper rifles made for sniping muzzleloaders, and they generally were bullet, bullet type rifling for the guns. So recovered bullets are bullets; they're not round balls. Um, and that was, in, you know, that was before the Civil War, and they had shoot matches, and long range matches. 
way back when, and they were they were using bullets then too. So I don't know. <laughs> The sniper rifles, they were they were shooting very long ranges with those things, you know, five, six hundred yards or nothing. But a round ball just don't fly that good, you know, that far. <laughs> Did any of the Hawkins ever be designed with a faster rifling for bullets versus balls, you know? I'm not from I I've, I've not seen one that I knew was rifled for a bullet. Okay. I'm not saying that they didn't do it, but I'm I'm not aware of it. Uh, that's a 66 inch twist. Well, that's a ball. Might be a strictly for round balls. The guns I build, I use either anywhere from 5 to 6 feet, 60 inches to 72 inches. Okay. And I've had both that shot equally, one will shoot just as good as the other. The 72 inch twist, you probably put a little more power in. But I generally make my guns 66 inches, right, right in the middle. And they, they've all shot very well. And then, I don't know if Dominic here, but was Hawkins ever flint line strictly? Uh, everyone I've ever seen is cat. That co question comes up all the time. And common sense tells you that they had to have made many flint locks really, but my question is, where are they? You don't, you, they got used up, they got, who knows, you know. The burning maple? Possibly, it, it possibly converted, but um, I've seen one original Hawken flint rifle that was never converted, and it, uh, there's no doubt what it is, but it doesn't look like we think the St. Louis, Saint Louis Hawkins should look. I don't know whether that's because it's just an early in the evolution of these things or why, I don't know. But uh, I've never seen a, a St. Louis style flint original Hawkins. No, I never will. <laughs> it, the early one? It was a full stock. What uh, museum? Private collection. Yes, sir. I'm sure they had them. I'm sure you know. You look at the uh, you know the early Springfields and stuff. They they were done on the ground. As far as the Hawkins go, I don't I don't know how you you'd have to get them in side by side and compare them. But I really believe that they were probably done from a bore. Yes, and there's enough variation in them. You know the same the same again. Nobody knows how many people they had working for them. And this, Jake and Sam didn't build all of them. You know, that's all. They're, they're going to vary from maker or, or uh, labor to labor, however you want to put it. They're going to be variation. But they all have parameters that they're within. There are no, there are no variation. I mean, you, know, you won't see one with a belly in it. Anywhere that they, they all had certain features. Um, she got the gun over there. One of the things I look at when somebody shows me a rifle that I, I turn it over and look along the bottom, the bottom line of the butt stock, and they're flat until it comes up to about where the, the, the back of the rear trigger. And there they change from flat to round to. to transition into the wrist of the gun. Most people miss that. that. That's one of the first things that I look at to see that you can see a, there's a sharp difference there. There's a, there's a change. Um, it, it, there's just several little things like that that you, know, you can't really, I don't think you can build one from a picture. You, know, you, you, 
you almost have to get them. I get all the guns in my hands that I can. I look at them and I feel them. I rub, rub them and I get as much out of feeling the gun as I do looking at it. There's subtle little, subtle little things that you can't pick up from a photograph. The uh, along the side of the buttstock, on the uh, not the cheapy side but the offside. There'll be a, it's just a very subtle high spot that runs from the upper corner of the butt plate down through the down through the butt and curves and makes an S to come up over the top of the lock panels. Um, people miss that. The same thing on a cheap piece side, but the cheap piece hides a lot of it. But they'll have that same that same uh, whatever you want to call it contour. Um, they're just they, I don't know whether it was Sam, somebody had been walking around and overseeing the production of these things. Because they're, now you pick one up and I don't care if it's a 1860s gun or an 1850s gun, they're going to have the same features, maybe in varying degrees, but they'll, they will have the same, the same features. But in cheap pieces, some of them, most of them are beaver tail rounded cheek pieces. Sometimes you'll see one with a Tennessee style cheek piece, the triangle or the rectangle or a rectangle type, type cheek piece. Um, on, a, on a squirrel rifle, you'll see that probably more on a squirrel rifle than a plains rifle, but there's, you see them on both guns. Most of them are, are beaver tail, what we call beaver tail cheek piece. Few of them have no cheap piece. They're just, uh, they're, they're each, no two are exactly alike, but they all have the same parameters. <clears throat> Marty, bring a, bring a gun over here, Marty. start here if you get the gun in a light you can see the, re the reflection just right it'll start here and it comes down and goes up over the top of the lock panels flop it over those. and you have the same thing on this side except it's up here the cheap piece blocks out this much of it but it continues on here and up over the lock panels they'll all have that what i was talking about the transition on the, from flat to round the guns will be flat here up until the back of the back trigger and then they, they, they transition into the roundness of the rest of the gun. I'm running out of... <laughs> yeah, anybody got another question, hopefully? I, I have not built more in a Hawkins shop than modern, or the, I've done Russell's, Art Russell's kits, but I've not done Greg's kit. They, to me, I've, I've looked at a couple of them, to me they look like they have enough wood that you could get that out of it. But it's just a matter of, you know, building that into the, into the gun as you're building it. But yeah, you can, you can get a proper gun out of, out of one of them for sure. <laughs> I heard that I heard that Jim was wanting to do one several years ago, and we were at the at the CLA. This is probably about three years ago, and he came over to our table, and I showed him my original gun. And just, again, there was a lot of a lot of misnomers about it, and mis wrong things that he thought. He was under the impression that they had bellies in them. And that. Well, I took a took a straight edge and laid across my real gun. And you see that this was straight, this was straight, this was straight. And then uh, he, uh, I explained to him about the taper, the taper of the barrel, combining with the taper of the lock panel, how that complicated things. And I, I, he didn't say so, but I think he maybe. 
concluded that these are a little bit more complicated in Kentucky. They're, they're, they're a different way of thinking. There's, uh, I don't think I could build a Kentucky rifle anymore because it's, it's, it's a different way of thinking doing these things. They're, they're really, they look very simple. Just, you look at them and think, oh, it's an old simple half-stock rifle. Well, that's, that's not the case at all. They're, they're really a very complicated gun, and if you if you want to do a correct one, you have to make it complicated like that. There's just no way, no no two ways around it. Any more questions? No. He, no, you could call it a you, you, you could call your Thompson Center kid or an Ohio gun just as easy as a St. Louis gun. No, there's there's they're really they're really not authentic as far as a true Hawken. But then again, the Hawken is one of misused terms like crescent wrench. You know, it's, you know, it's a it's a very it's become a very generic term. And they're in my in my and then they either are or they ain't. You know, there's no, no pretty good hawk, and there's no, you know, either they're either really good or they're bad. You know, it's as far as trying to emulate a hawk and rifle, you can build a, a very nice half stock rifle, but it may not be a hawk. So it just depends on it matters whether it suits you. You know, that, that's that's the the key, the key to the whole thing. It's what the muzzle of rifle evolved to be. You know, there's no question about that. It's just, I think it's uh, you know the top of the line, but that's that's my opinion. You know, a lot of people like relief carver and grave Kentuckys, and they're great too. But they weren't the end. They weren't the end of the road. You know, these these things were around until cartridge guns supplanted them. So, in my opinion, that's in my opinion. They're the highest form of muzzle loading rifle, and that for whatever it is. Okay, question. Talk about Especially with a lock in the barrel, the mating of that, it's a lot more challenging to manufacture. Like, what's the benefit of that in performance, in your opinion? It's not performance, it's ease of cleaning and maintenance. You pop the ramrod out of them, take the two keys out, put the gun on half cock, and you got the barrel in your hands. Okay. The way I clean them, I take, I take the nipple out, I boil, boil a pot of water, take the nipple out, Put the breech end of the barrel in, into the hot water with a little Murphy's oil soap and a cleaning rod with a patch on it, swab the barrel out with that. It brings water into the barrel and flushes out the flushes out the breech. And you don't boil it afterwards? Oh yeah. You do oil it like that. Well you do you use hot water and then by the time you get done swabbing the barrel, the barrel will be hot enough that you, you don't want to touch it. So I turn it upside down, muzzle down, just let it set for five or ten minutes and let it cool off while it evaporates. <coughs> evaporates the moisture out of the inside of the gun. Then when I get done with that, I take two or three um, dry cleaning patches and run down the barrel just to get any water or anything else that might have been left in there. And when I feel that it's comfortable that the, that the thing is dry, and then I'll use uh, another cleaning patch with whatever preservative you want to use. You know, three-in-one oil. To, I don't like WD-40, but Ballastol or stuff like that, and just run a, run a wet patch with that in it, wipe it off, and you're pretty much done. Or if a gun, if you can't pop the barrel out of the gun. Then you gotta keep running past it uh, and clean it until they finally finally get clean. But it's just so much easier when you can when you can put the barrel in a pot of water and clean it. <coughs> Anybody else? Yeah. 
Right. I don't use fake black eyes. <coughs> so I'm not experienced. I've heard that you can clean the gun, clean the gun, clean the gun. It still rusts the inside of it. Is this? There's been a lot of good muzzle orders run with, uh, what's that, what do they call this? Pyrex. Yeah, there's been a lot of good guns run with that. I, when I build a gun, I give, a, I give them a little sheet how to clean the gun step by step. And I always always put it at the bottom of big letters, black powder only. Use no no black powder substitutes. You can't improve on perfection. No, I, I believe that. I see so many people right in the fireplace. Oh, yeah, I got a clean slide. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Have you heard anything? Uh, I've heard that the GOAX is coming back online. So they're supposed to be, it's going to be available again, readily available again. So caps the same way, you know, the percussion caps are hard to find. But I think that's just probably people order them as much as anything. Powder i I'm, I'm not familiar with it. There's a place in Arkansas that you can buy black powder from the percussion cap. I think it's called Powder A. And, and they're really good and they'll ship it right to the house. Place in Oh yeah, we uh, if you haven't made it up to the Sappington house, it's as far as you can go that way up in the corner of the property. But there's a, a, a pretty good sized house, it's air conditioned, so you can come in and cool off. But we have uh, Oh, I don't know how many original St. Louis and Missouri guns are there on display. That's a display that you will see nowhere else. And there's, the guns are not that plentiful to begin with, and to have that many of them in this, in this spot at the same time is, is really a treat. So everybody, I highly recommend go up the hill and come in and look at the guns. You can. You know, you ask permission, the guys will let you pick them up, you can look at them, study them. It's just a, it's an opportunity that doesn't happen very often. Probably never again, maybe, I don't know. Depends on this time next year. <laughs> I'm sorry? My shop? It's in my basement. <laughs> You know, I live in St. Louis, well, west of St. Louis, of Western Groves. I, uh, <laughs> I'm not worried about that. I've, I'm getting to the age where I'm not wanting to stay so busy all the time, so I quit taking orders. I have a, I have a call list that I'm, I'm keeping, and when, when I get them, ready to build another gun and I'll go to the top of this and call a guy and say, you still want a gun? And if they do, then we figure out what they want and, and get started on it. We're having... Uh, could you tell them how much your gun sold for an auction at the COA show last year? Well, that was a one-time deal and that was... I'm embarrassed that... that <laughs> I, gun sold for $10,500. That was a, uh, a few years ago, a very close friend loaned me an original JNS Hawken rifle to use as a study, to use, I, to, to you to build bench copies from. It's, it's a very rare gun, half a dozen of them, no, maybe of that. Uh, just very fortunate to have access to the gun. And I, the breach, every, there's a whole lot of different stuff about that rifle. 
It's a pre-1849 gun, probably, this was probably 1840 period, maybe 35. Anyway, the breech is, the breech is very different than on a later gun. And I had some made, and I have to do a lot of filing, a lot of, a lot of work on the things to make them correct. But that's what I did, the, uh, the auction gun was a JNS, one of my JNS Hawkins. I think I built four of them so far. I'm having trouble, uh, under ribs are a problem now, or we're working on having some under ribs made. And I'm dealing with a, a, sh a shop in Montana to, to make the breeches for that early gun. The S Hawkins, the, uh, the breech that you can get from Track of the Wolf is fine for those. They, they, work out, they work out just fine, but they're not really correct for, for an earlier gun. So we've been, been working on bringing one of those out, which we have, uh, I have a pattern, I made a pattern. I, I use pre carb stocks. I, I made my pattern, and there's a place that I, that I deal with, just this one, one company, and they, make, they rub the stocks out for me. They're rough shaped on the outside. They have a lot of wood left on them. The barrel channels are cut, and that's it. You know, I have to go in letting for the lock or triggers, or no, not even a ramrod hole. I, I do all that in the shop. That allows me to do slight variations of them. I can make maybe a gun that I'm tilted towards an earlier period or a later period. I have enough enough leeway in those that I can that I can adapt it. But I do, those basically are the only two guns I do are an S and a JNS. No flaps. <laughs> I got one last deal with it for us. Can you tell us about the story about the uh, Andrew Jackson pistol that you made from a Jeremy Hawkins? Back in 2012, uh, the CLA were going to, they wanted to commemorate the War of 1812. So they asked me to build a, uh, at the Hermitage, they found a single dueler. The other one was gone, which is a whole other story on our show. How it came out. I'll go through it real quick. There was a, a man named Philip Kramer, had his shop downtown St. Louis, 4th and Olive. And I think it was 1833, I believe, was a year that those pistols were made very fine pair of wonderful dueling pistols. They were cased with all the accessories. A man, I think they were made for a man named Calhoun who gave them to Andrew Jackson. Somehow, I don't know how, what the Raiders were, but Andrew Jackson wound up with the pistols. Something broke on one of the pistols, so they sent it to a gun shop to have it repaired. And while it was in a gun shop, one of the pistols in a box of accessories disappeared. The other pistol, the remaining pistol, wound up at the Hermitage. And uh, so they had that one, something to go by. So I was asked to copy that pistol. Well, David Wright, I don't know, David's here, friend of ours, he uh, photographed and measured the gun for me. He, he lived in Nashville. <coughs> so I built the pistol. And while all this is going on, a mutual friend of ours has a, has a wonderful museum in, in San, outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. He, got a, he published a three-volume book. And in this book is a, Philip by, a pistol by Philip Kramer. Well, a mutual friend of ours was looking at it, flipping through the page, and he looked at that pistol and said, well, there's the mate to the one at Dermage. And when you look at them, there is absolutely no doubt they are, they were the pair. Well, I've, or, I've since that had my hands on the one in New Mexico. And he took it back. When all this came about, he took it back to the Hermitage and had a, I've got a photograph of home and the two pistols together. And they, uh, <clears throat> there is no doubt they are a pair. And anyway, um, I built a gun and it was auctioned off, and that's the way the story goes. Well, that's another story. <laughs>
a dealer friend of ours, I don't know if Gene's here or not, Gene bought the gun at auction. And a couple of years later, I got a phone call. A man named Jesse Dillon. And I didn't know who Jesse was. I was talking, and he said he's uh, <coughs> wanted to know if that pistol was available. And I know Gene doesn't hang on to much, so he'd probably sell it. So I, I gave him uh, Gene's phone number, where the pistol was. They got together and made the deal. Well, I asked the guy, who's, you know, who's it for? He said, it's for my father. He's gonna give it to him as a birthday present. Well, his father was a musician, Bob Dylan, you know, all heard of him. Anyway, Bob Dylan was on, uh, on tour in Europe at the time, so it was a surprise that, that his son Jesse got this gun for him and acquired it for his birthday, so that's who has the gun now. Would have never thought of him as a gun collector. Well, I didn't either, so I asked Jesse, I said, what's the deal? Your father, why is he interested in this gun? Is he a gun collector or what? He said, no, he's not a gun collector, but he loves American history, especially Andrew Jackson. So that's how, how they got a hold of me, I have no idea. But yeah, it, went, it all worked out. What did it sell more at the auction? I don't know, 40, more, $4,500, or something like that. <laughs> Anybody got any other? But I would probably recommend a guy that's never, never seen a gun before, go get a Kipper kit. They have all Jim Kipper. They have all the holes grown, and, and, and I, I know I have never done one myself, but I have several friends that have done them. One, one friend of mine said, well, you just threw it up in the air and it came down finished. There, there's hardly any, any guesswork to do in those. That will get you familiar with using chisel, file, and sandpaper, and everything else to, to finish the gun, but that would be a good start. If you want to build a gun from scratch, say, that's not a good place to start. You got to start with a, with something, you know, something a little, a little simple.